Midnight Facts for Insomniac. <laughs> I just learned something. Oh, I'm having fun now. I don't think saber tooth tigers were running up a tree. No, I'm not saying they couldn't. I'm pretty sure they would just turn around and like Mick Dundee be like, "Ass on a tooth. This is a tooth." <laughs> <laughs> I think you're going to like this one. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. I'm not being sarcastic. Okay. This is an animal episode. We like the animal episodes. Oh, I am the muse. We love those. So fauna is a fancy word for animals, and mega is a fancy word for big. So today we're talking about big, fancy animals. Among the various definitions of megafauna that you will find is any animal over 100 pounds. So most humans could technically be considered megafauna. I'm like megafauna squared. You're a couple of megafauna. <laughs> Unless you're, I guess if you're a small human, if you're a child, you don't qualify as megafauna here. Just fauna. Minor fauna. <laughs> lesser fauna? That sounds mean. Yeah, lesser fauna. <laughs> it's Duncan the Lesser, the lesser fauna. We're just going to add less to this kid's name. Give him a real complex. But typically when scientists talk about megafauna, they are referring to extinct species. Yeah. And in particular, like dinosaurs and the massive Ice Age era precursors of many common animals that we know today. Right. Before there were elephants, there were woolly mammoths. Before there were chickens and ostriches, there were velociraptors. Before there were sloths, there were big-ass sloths. Yeah, mega sloths. That is the official taxonomy, by the way. Really? Big, big-ass sloths. Big, big-ass sloths. I like it. Mm. If you hopped in a time machine and set your target for a couple million years ago in the Americas, you would find lions roaming the countryside, hunting sloths the size of monster trucks, and battling dire wolves and saber-toothed tigers. I don't believe you in the dire wolves. Dire wolves are real. V- what fucking what? Yeah, that was uh, George R. R. Martin, kind of lazy, actually. <laughs> he just used an animal that isn't around anymore. Oh. Huh. Or genius, you know. <laughs> he had dragons. He was like, all right, I already got one of these make-believe fucking animals. No. Dire wolves are uh, an extinct species of wolf. Fuck. They're not even that... Uh, they weren't, like, mega, really. Mm. They're not even that much bigger than gray wolves. I was going to say, because if you've ever seen a gray wolf, they're fucking huge. Yeah, these were a little bit larger. We'll talk about dire mm. wolves. But yeah, if you were living back then, you could ride on the distant ancestors of modern camels while fleeing from bears that weighed 5,000 pounds and marveling at lumbering armadillo-like creatures known as glyptodons that were as big as Volkswagen beetles. Or I could not. That sounds like a dystopian nightmare. In Australia, there were seven-foot-tall flightless birds and ten-foot-tall kangaroos and a menagerie of other deadly creatures. So, like, now? So nothing really changed. Changed at all. Yeah. <laughs> Australia, Australia just kept it real. <laughs> still a nightmare. Yeah. But they did have giant fuzzy wombats called Diprotodon. Which makes me very happy. Wombats are adorable, even if they're 6,000 pounds. Still snuggleable. I mean, probably stinky, but definitely stinky snuggleable. Worth it. (laughs) So cute. You and tigers and ginormous (laughs) wombats, man. If it's stinky and fuzzy, for some reason you got a thing for it. It's cool. Meanwhile, uh, Europe was teeming with cave hyenas and woolly mammoths that actually spanned all the continents. It Mm. was just, it was a wild time. Yeah. But the truth is that giant organisms never really went away. In fact, we live alongside the largest organism to ever inhabit planet Earth. Do you want to guess the identity of the largest organism of all time? I mean, the one that I'm thinking about doesn't roam the Earth. It's rather sedentary. The the redwoods? Uh, No, it's not the redwoods, but you're on the right track. Want to guess again? Uh, Is it fungus? Well, potentially. So you might notice I was being sneaky with my verbiage. I said the largest organism that exists today, thereby initiating a tangent that has (laughs) nothing to do with today's topic. It's not megafauna. Mm. But it is fascinating. The largest organism on Earth is not megafauna. It's megaflora, the aspen tree. Aspens. That's right. It wasn't redwoods. It's aspens. Which grows in interconnected clone colonies that can span five miles linked by giant underground root systems. The largest known organism to ever have existed is an aspen colony called Pando, located in Utah. Of course it's in Utah. It's also the heaviest organism that we are aware of, weighing more than 6,000 tons. Me. And if that weren't enough, it's among the oldest living known organisms with a root system estimated to be thousands of years old. Huh. There is actually another candidate for the heavyweight mega-organism title, 
and you mentioned it, a mega fungi, a mushroom in eastern Oregon called Armillaria estoyae. Armillaria has the unique ability to extend rhizomorphs, flat shoestring-like structures that bridge gaps between food sources and expand the fungus's sweeping perimeter evermore. Collectively, this network is called the mycelium and is of an indefinite shape and size, unquote. That doesn't sound at all freakish at all. Yeah, fuck Skynet and zombies. We need to be keeping an eye on this clone network of rhizomorphs. It's creepy AF. That actually sounds worse than xenomorphs. Yeah. You heard it here first. We're all going to die. And as usual, I will immediately betray the human race and welcome our new fungi overlords. <laughs> Rhizomorph overlords. <laughs> But returning from our tangent to the topic at hand, we do also live alongside the largest example of megafauna ever to exist. Want to guess? Sure. Uh, heffalumps? <laughs> you, you should know this. Okay. What is the largest animal on Earth? Not necessarily terrestrial. Oh, okay. Yeah, the blue whale. Bellinoptera musculus. The blue whale can reach 30 meters, a.k.a. 90 feet long, weighing around 200 tons. The largest are the Antarctic blue these are baleen whales that feed on krill. All blue whales are. Instead of teeth, their mouths are packed with fibrous hairs that they use like a sieve, drawing in massive draughts of water packed with krill, and then they push the water out through the hairs and then just gulp. Mm -hmm. They have hairy mouths. It's kind of unpleasant. Yeah. Sounds like the worst non-brusher ever. Yeah. Imagine shedding into your own mouth. Oh, Airball. <laughs> they must choke up some pretty epic hairballs. That's, yeah. Yeah. You think it's all musical. <laughs> And then, you know, every 30 minutes, <laughs> you don't want to be in the blast zone. No, yeah. if you're a poor scuba diver anywhere near that whale, you are going deaf, sir. I am glad that humans do not eat like baleen whales. That is, take a big slurp of soup and then squirt the broth through your teeth and gulp down the chunks. Dates would be even more awkward, I feel. <laughs> I've met babies that eat like that. Yeah. And that's what bibs are for. Yeah. So we typically think of giant reptiles like the dinosaurs as being the largest animals to ever live on Earth, but blue whales are mammals. They give birth to live young, just like we do. They nurse them, they breathe air, they have nipples, and they produce milk. From a Discovery Wildlife article, quote, the blue whale has the largest mammary glands on Earth. Each is about 1.5 meters long and weighs as much as a baby elephant. Jeebus, I wanted to make a Tiggo Bitties joke, but then I was just like, um, that's too big. I guarantee there's... Big titty whale porn. <laughs> God. <laughs> Somebody's into that. I guarantee it. So even though we think of megafauna as a phenomenon of the past, the largest megafauna of all time still exists today in the ocean. And even when it comes to land animals, you can find some genuinely impressive examples of megafauna these days, especially at your local circus or zoo. Or if you live in Canada, you might find one in your yard. Have you ever seen a moose up close? No, I've never seen a moose's. They are freaking huge. Mm. They're terrifyingly large. Or you could head to Africa and you're just a safari away from megafauna like elephants and giraffes, hippos, rhinoceri. Did you see any big... Uh... Oh, yeah. I even saw the awesomest of all awesome. I saw plains, real plains African elephants, which are fucking ginormous. And then I saw a baby, baby African elephant playing in his mama's face. Oh, well... It was the size of our fucking hatchback. It was ginormous, but it was still a little tiny bird, but it was so cute. And you were in, so you were in Kenya, was it? Yeah. That you spent some time. Yeah, so we were going through, it was their their major wildlife preserve. Um, and uh, near near the base of Mount Kilimanjaro, sort of. Megafauna by a mega hill. Yeah, That's mega it. hill. <laughs> the mountains is the mega hill. <laughs> fair <laughs> enough, fair. But you don't have to go to Africa. To see megafauna, you could drop by your local farm or field. Cows and horses are legit megafauna. Have you been next to a Clydesdale recently? Those things are freaking massive. No, but they terrify me because they can legit kick your head off. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you haven't been in the vicinity of a cow or a large horse recently, go, go pet one. I recommend petting cows and horses for many reasons. They are delightful. They will thaw your Grinch heart. Mm. And also, they're freaking huge. Mm -hmm. And it's just a good reminder that like any cow could kick your ass. Dude, cow would fuck up your whole day and your family. We're very lucky that we have somehow convinced cows and horses <laughs> that they cannot uh, just willy-nilly beat us up whenever they feel like it. Yeah. Because they could willy-nilly beat us up if ever they felt like it. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that the second the nuclear winter comes, they will decide once again to reevaluate their herbivism. 
So we do still have some animals that qualify as megafauna on land, but the largest versions of land animals that we have today are still puny compared to their prehistoric ancestors. Think of the difference between like a house cat and a tiger. That's the type of scale we're talking about here. Jeebus. And we have to talk about one of my personal favorites, the previously referenced giant sloth. We're all familiar with the modern, cute, lazy little tree sloth who weighs around 20 pounds or 10 kilograms. The giant, monstrous ground sloths, officially named Megatherium, could weigh five tons, and they existed alongside and may have even battled our human ancestors. While the biggest sloths are thought to have disappeared around 10,000 years ago, as recently as 1550 BC, there were still bear-sized giant sloths roaming around in the Caribbean. Fun. Nothing quite like a very slow-moving bear with claws longer than your femur. Claws that were like, you know, three feet long. I mean, this is <laughs> crazy. But they were uh, still herbivores. They're just chilling. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to eat you, but they probably also didn't want to be petted. <laughs> so. Didn't want to scratch on his chin either. If you come near him close enough, they might bat your head off. If you want to see examples of megafauna while also learning about them in detail, a great place to start is the La Brea Tar Pits. Mm. Located in Southern California, the La Brea Tar Pits consist of over 100 bubbling pools of thick crude oil, a substance that was historically used by Native Americans to seal their boats, and Ice Age animals frequently found themselves stuck and entombed in the goopy substance. Mm. Mammoths, ground sloths, dire wolves, American lions, and yes, as we mentioned, there were lions in America, the saber-toothed cats, uh, which, by the way, is the state fossil of California. Really? Yeah. Huh. I didn't know we had a state skeleton, but we do. It's the saber-toothed cat. I don't know if every state has a state skeleton. <laughs> it seems like eventually they'd run out of cool Ice Age animals and just have to settle for some dude. <laughs> this is Our state skeleton is Jeff. <laughs> Our state skeleton is Ned. <laughs> the most famous fossil that you can still visit at the La Brea Museum, which is located on the side of the pits, is Zed, an almost completely intact woolly mammoth, only missing the top of its head, which was shaved off by a construction crew when they were preparing to create the parking structure. <laughs> Whoops! Someone got fired. Oh, yeah. A little. Reading about uh, the La Brea Tar Pits made me really want to go there. I can't believe I've been to L.A. so many times, and yeah. it's like right in the middle of L.A. It's <laughs> not like in the outskirts. You don't have to drive super far. It's like right there. I, I'm definitely going next time. Word. I'll go with you. It's This could be the first on our uh, Miffy Tour list. We'll go take pictures with the with Zed. <laughs> See, I, now I have to go. Zed's dead, baby. Zed's dead. Like 10,000 years. Yeah, it's been a bit. <laughs> So let's talk about the obvious question. Where did all of the big land animals go? Obviously, we still have the biggest water animal, mm. but uh, what happened to all the roaming land creatures? There are not enough tar pits to drown them all. Well, throughout history, there have been natural extinction events and man-made extinction events. Our ancestors weren't particularly concerned about preserving endangered species. Not a lot of prehistoric conservationists. No, they're mostly trying to conserve themselves. For the first 8,000 years or so of human history, Maslow's hierarchy of needs didn't allow for the luxury of giving a fuck about creatures that weren't your immediate family. Mm. So it's a good bet that human hunting, at the very least, contributed to the extinction of many of the Pleistocene or Ice Age megafauna, but many scientists believe climate change was at least partially, if not fully, to blame, which underscores the importance of environmental protection. So we talk about preserving the environment, but what that really means is that we're trying to keep the environment from destroying us. Right, or as George Carlin said... No, the planet will be fine. We'll be dead. Yeah. Environmental preservation is just self-preservation. Right. Because destroying living creatures is something the environment is very good at doing. Oh, yeah. When it comes to natural extinctions, there have been five major extinction events that we know of. And the true era of the giants, the Mesozoic era, which encompasses the dinosaur-infested Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods, ended with one of the most dramatic extinctions. Boom explode. Here's a quick overview of the five. The Ordovician Silurian extinction of 440 million years ago. We'll start back there. Oh, that old saw. I remember this. No, I don't. As you're well aware. Yeah. Who isn't keeping up on their 440 million years ago history? This first major extinction occurred before life had emerged from the oceans. Dick move, God. <laughs> oh, are you almost you almost there? <laughs> there was one little fin reached out onto land. God was like, nope. Not yet. Not today, <laughs> sucker. Not today, fish bitch. <laughs> uh, 
Obviously, it's a little tough for us to conclusively determine the cause of events from 400 million years ago, but the best guess is that some type of climate event was triggered by emerging volcanoes or maybe even gamma rays from a supernova that like ripped a hole in the ozone layer. We most likely will probably never know, but what we do know is that the extinction event killed off around 85% of the species that existed at that time. Mostly tiny marine organisms, so not a super dramatic extinction, Mm. unless you were a tiny marine organism 400 million years ago. Then it was pretty dramatic. (laughs) Yeah, it was. most of you disappeared. It was Thanos' snap times a jillion. Yeah. So next we have the Devonian extinction of 365 million years ago. Where all the Devons died. So by this point, the most prevalent animals on Earth were fishes. In fact, the Devonian period is often referred to as the Age of Fish. Mm. Sounds smelly. Mm. But we also did have some land animals and also a proliferation of plants, which were mostly to blame for this second mass extinction of marine life. Were they all like fall over at once? They were just dicks. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Not today, fish bitch. Quote, as plants evolved roots, they inadvertently transformed the land they lived on, turning rock and rubble into soil. This nutrient-rich soil then ran into the world's oceans, causing algae to bloom on an enormous scale. These blooms essentially created giant, quote, dead zones, which are areas where algae stripped oxygen from the water, suffocating marine life and wreaking havoc on marine food chains, unquote. Damn. So, like, the happening kind of sort of happened, but, you know, 30 bajillion years ago and it was just trees and they didn't really mean to do it no it wasn't trees versus fishes (laughs) it was just oops yeah that movie would be very quiet and very slow (laughs) yeah like i said a lot of this not super dramatic Mm -mm. it was just like uh over time algae bloomed fish died wasn't an asteroid and tyrannosaurus rex is running for their lives or anything Mm. tyrannosaurus is rex is that like whoppers jr (laughs) Because it's like secretaries of state. No, it's I not it. state secretaries. And it's, is it Tyrannosaurus is Rex? It's a fair question. <laughs> You're the English major, man. Don't look at me. <laughs> I'm going to find out. All right. For next time. Okay, okay. So some 75% of ocean species bit the dust during this extinction. Hmm. Or whatever the aquatic version of dust is. I guess it was mostly silt. They bit the mud. On to the Permian-Triassic extinction. Now we've moved up another 100 million years or so. So this was 250 million years ago. This was the largest extinction event in history. And now we're finally killing off land animals. So it feels personal. Mm. This one is pretty extreme. Often referred to as the Great Dying. This extinction event erased 90% of life on Earth. Heck. The Permian-Triassic extinction is believed to have been caused by rampant volcanism. The Earth was still very tectonically active, and a massive eruption of volcanoes spewed carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. It basically created the greenhouse effect that we're all worried about today. Hmm. So if you think climate change is a hoax or whatever, just talk to the reptiles, insects, plants, and amphibians of the Permian era. Oh, wait. I hope you speak fossil. So now we're on to the Triassic-Jurassic extinction of 210 million years ago. Hmm. Starting to get real close. Feels like yesterday. This is the extinction event that cleared the way for the monstrous lizards, which is the literal meaning of the word dinosaur. Mm. The cause of this one is a bit of a mystery, but volcanoes again seem to be a likely culprit. Extinction events like this one often wipe the evolutionary slate clean and make room for the emergence of a new type of critter. And speaking of which, we humans wouldn't be here without the Cretaceous Tertiary extinction of 65 million years ago. 65 million years ago, there were so many lizards I had never met. (laughs) This final extinction event is easily the most, well, final, you know, we hope. (laughs) Final until until our turn. next one, yeah. Yeah. This most recent major extinction event is easily the most famous. And while it was not the most extreme, it still did take out 75% of species on Earth. Mm. So, you know, pretty respectable body count. Yeah. Yeah. Also known as the KT extinction, because it happened at the end of the Cretaceous period and the beginning of the Tertiary period. Though if you're an English major, you're probably wondering why KT instead of CT, because... Cretaceous is not spelled with a K. Right. Well, apparently C was already being used for an earlier period, the Cambrian. So geologists use K as shorthand for Cretaceous. Because not English majors. But the KT extinction, as you probably know, was caused by a giant asteroid over 8 miles or 13 kilometers wide that slammed into the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico and raised a titanic mushroom cloud of dust and debris that blotted out the sun, which killed off plant life and caused a chain reaction... When the plants died, the plant-eating herbivores died. And when the herbivores died, the carnivores died. 
Yep. It was a tipping of dominoes that ended the age of giant reptiles and offered little rodent-like mammals the chance to flourish. And those furry pests are our distant ancestors. Yes, we were basically the descendants of furry cucarachas. We were essentially vermin. Yep. That were small enough and scrappy enough to survive the global holocaust. The KT extinction wiped out half of all the animals and plants on Earth. It was like a reset button for evolution. There would still be some large critters, obviously, because as we've already mentioned, megafauna persisted all the way up until the recent Ice Age, about 10,000 years ago. But land animals would never again achieve the size of the dinosaurs. And as we already established, there was another minor wave of extinctions that is not included in these five because it wasn't nearly as impactful or dramatic. But after the last Ice Age, the Pleistocene era that ended around 10,000 years ago, that's when humans began to really flourish, which coincided with the disappearance of some of the most famous megafauna on Earth. Saber-toothed tigers, woolly mammoths, those big-ass sloths. There's probably no connection between the rise of humans and the decline of these animals. I can't think of any reason that uh, they would have suddenly started to not be as prevalent. Nothing comes to mind. We don't kill off huge swaths of creatures. That's just not something we do. We are historically gentle species, and we have very little impact on our surroundings. Absolutely. Stewards of the planet. <laughs> yes. That's, I couldn't even not laugh at that. <laughs> I could not keep it up. And by the way, if you're getting confused by all of this epoch era period stuff, that is the geological time scale, or the GTS. And here's a quick and easy breakdown. Quote, an era equals a unit of time shorter than an eon, but longer than a period. A period is a unit of time shorter than an era, but longer than an epoch. An epoch is a unit of time shorter than a period, but longer than an age. Got it. Say that fucking again. <laughs> what? That was my favorite online definition because it's like a Zen cone or something. <laughs> I was <laughs> puzzling over that for a while. It basically, it's just saying uh, an eon is the longest stretch of time, followed by an era, then an epoch, and finally an age. And by the way, the age, which is the shortest measure of geological time, is millions of years long. Sweet. So I've got some time. The scale of geological time is just mind-boggling. Yeah. So just to set our scene, we are currently in the Phanerozoic Eon, the Cenozoic Era, the Quaternary Period, and the Megalion Age. Uh -huh. Mega lion is M E G H A L A Y A N. Maybe it's Megalion. I like Mega lion because it sounds very Voltron, <laughs> furry. <laughs> so now we've located ourselves in time. I'm mm. sure that was super helpful. Yeah, I'm. I'm just thinking about all those fucking definitions and all that stuff in your house, like a Zen cone. I was just thinking, what is the sound of one brain bleeding? <laughs> this is a lot to absorb. I'm throwing a lot at you. A lot mm. of uh, digits and uh, facts. You've seen my bony ass head. It's just bouncing off. It's fine. Well, there is a lot. And we're going to cover some more. We have covered some history, some chronology. We've covered some geology and biology. And soon we are going to talk in detail about the most impressive of these mega critters. Mm. I promise we're getting there. But it would be an oversight if we didn't explain why large size is so damn impressive. Mm. That's what she said. Mm. Well, first off, it's not easy being huge. It's not easy being huge. That's what he said. Yeah. Have you heard of the square cube law? Square comes first, cube comes after, because they're made out of one of the other things. It's also known as, why don't we have giant ants? That's what I like to think of it as. Ah. This is a little bit complicated, but it comes down to the fact that as an object gets bigger, its volume increases more than its surface area. Basically, when the outside of an object grows a little bit, the inside grows a lot. So, quote, if an animal were isometrically scaled up by a considerable amount its relative muscular strength would be severely reduced since the cross-section of its muscles would increase by the square of the scaling factor while its mass would increase by the cube of the scaling factor. As a result of this, cardiovascular and respiratory functions would be severely burdened, unquote. Brain still bleeding over there. Okay. <laughs> well, the point is you can't just take a small animal and make it big without completely redesigning its musculature and adding bigger, denser bones and an upgraded cardiovascular system, etc. It's like, look, an ant has spindly little legs, right? Mm. But it can still carry like 50 other ants because it is tiny and its strength is off the charts in proportion to its weight. Mm -hmm. But if you scaled that ant to the size of a truck, its weight would increase far more than its stability and strength and its little spindly legs would collapse. Got it. Thank you for putting it in stupid. I always wonder why you wait till the very end of everything. I think you just like to listen to me bleed cranily. This is why you can build a house with wood, but you can't build a skyscraper with wood. So I hate to break it to you, but King Kong and Godzilla, they are impossible. Yeah, not, not things. They would collapse under their sheer size and weight. Right. 
a realistic clash between Godzilla and King Kong would have been a lot less dramatic. They would have just been laying side by side with their bones liquefied, just moaning. <laughs> or they would have pulled, you know, a, a blue whale that's been beached. They were just sort of laying there and slowly suffocated under the weight of their own muscle mass. Yeah, not very cinematic. No. And of course, this is why the biggest animal to ever inhabit the planet lives in the water. The buoyancy of water helps support and distribute that extra weight. So now we know why giant animals are built the way they are and why there will never be fauna the size of Godzilla. But let's talk about a few that came pretty damn close. Hmm. We're going to cover some of the biggest, the largest everything ever that lived. Buggins. So the largest land animal on Earth currently is, as you mentioned, the African elephant, while the largest carnivore on Earth currently is the polar bear. You might notice there's a slight discrepancy between these two critters size-wise. And does any major difference jump out at you? Something that might account for that discrepancy? Uh, one of them has to seek out, hunt down, and catch plants. And the other one has to seek out, hunt down, and catch meat. Yes, and as we know, plants are uh, slightly less agile. Hmm, yeah. yeah, not a whole lot of tracking, killing, hunting, and bashing. Carnivores on land tend to be limited in size, while herbivores can grow huge. And the reason is obvious, if you think about it. As you mentioned, it takes energy to be a predator. You have to be quick and adaptive, whereas an herbivore can literally lounge around all day just munching on grass or foliage or tree bark or whatever. You can be a giant sloth. You can be slothful. Yeah, I mean, African elephants aren't exactly slothful, and they do occasionally throw down with each other. But, yeah, I mean, generally, they're just sort of moving from one place to another in that sort of long-legged stride they got. Yeah, they're not as active as, you know, a uh, leopard. Or a polar bear jumping from iceberg to iceberg and killing fucking leopard seals, which are redonkulous. Yeah, so for a carnivore, large size can be a disadvantage because you're too slow to catch your prey, and it also takes an incredible amount of meat and calories to maintain your active lifestyle. Yeah. Meanwhile, for an herbivore, being huge is easier to maintain because your lazy grass-munching ass isn't burning many calories. And being huge is actually an evolutionary advantage for an herbivore because you're a hassle to take down. Yeah, yeah. Most predators are going to go for the smaller and easier prey and leave you alone. Right. It becomes a bit difficult problem to breed after a while if all of your youngins keep getting picked off by lion prides. But, you know, that's why you evolve tusks and ginormous charging. Yeah, that's why you're a stompy stomperson. Mm -hmm. You got big old feet. Big old feetsies make a flat lion. Now, of course, the largest animal ever, the blue whale, is not an herbivore, but the rules are just different in the water. It's just we're not going to count that. Mm -hmm. Krill don't take a lot of energy to harvest. They are not plants, but they kind of might as well be. They're like the ocean's grass. Yeah, them and, uh, you know, because plankton also involve a lot of, like, algae or, you know, microorganisms. They're not just krill. So, like, yeah. It's... Yeah, they're taking in, like, biomass, basically. Yeah. It's just, you know, blue whales aren't chasing down and slaughtering schools of dolphins. They're just, like, aqua grazing. Yeah. Now, the megalodon, they used to eat whales. Yes, giant sharks. But again, uh, in the ocean, you can just be faster. But, you know, they're still not as big as a blue whale. Blue whale's not going to be zipping around like that. No. Let's talk about the largest animal to ever walk the earth. Yes. This was the Patagotitan Mayorum. Lived in Patagonia? You can probably guess that this animal's name references the titans of Greek mythology as well as Patagonia, hmm. the region in South America. So this is a titan from South America. The size of 12 African elephants. Patago Titan was a literal monster. It basically looked like a brontosaurus, but like on steroids. Over 130 feet long, more than 40 meters, and weighing 85 tons. Obviously, these are estimates, but I think it's safe to say it was, you know, hefty. F fucking huge. Its thigh bone was discovered in Argentina by a farm worker in 2008, and six partial skeletons were eventually unearthed. Quote, given the size of these bones, which surpass any of the previously known giant animals, the new dinosaur is the largest animal known that walked on Earth, unquote. You know that poor farmer was just like, well, yeah, this is great, but now I got to get a tree stump puller to pull this gigantic fucking bone out of my farmland so I can go back to planting food. How would you even know that was a bone? I would just be like, look at this giant white boulder. Or this tree that's fucking dead. There is some debate about the largest animal to ever walk the earth. Other scientists maintain that Argentinosaurus, I bet you'll never guess where that one was found. South Africa. Is still the largest dinosaur ever discovered, but the Argentinosaurus bones were very fragmentary. We really only have part of the rear legs and like a hip. And that is something that I think a lot of people don't understand. When you see the giant skeleton of a Tyrannosaurus rex or a Brontosaurus in a museum, first off, you're probably not seeing any real bones. Instead, you're seeing casts of bone. Right. 
But even the original bones that were discovered were most likely just a few parts of a leg, a few parts of a spine, maybe a claw, and then the rest were imagined, just sculpted based on extrapolation. Right. And I mean, we're not going to paint this in too ridiculousness. Like, they didn't just like, and it goes here. They did it, they extrapolated from like muscle attachment sites and like where shit sort of looks like it goes based on regular human situations. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you know, definitely you can say that animals that have thigh bones like this typically have shoulder bones like this, right? But some of, a lot of this was just like the Wild West. I mean, there was a time when they were just kind of winging it. There have been skeletons in museums for years and then they realized that the head was completely incorrect. Yeah, no, I I actually got into this for a while as a kid, and there were, like, dinosaur fossil wars out in the middle of fucking Nevada or some shit between two scientists. Yeah, the bone wars. We'll talk about that a little bit briefly. So, yeah, much of it is a guessing game, though obviously these are highly educated guesses. The average dinosaur had around 200 bones, but when it comes to the Titanosaurus, less than half of those have ever been found for any single specimen. The most complete skeleton included around 80 bones. Hmm. Uh, Quote, no one's found a single complete fossil skeleton of Patagotitan Myorum yet, but scientists can estimate how big it was and what its missing bones look like based on what they know about other long-necked titanosaurs. So paleontologists really are like detectives recreating a creature from a limited set of data. Yeah, I mean, really, it's like recreating the human skeleton based on, like, a leg here and a shin bone there and a rib cage here and part of a mandible. Like, yeah, it's it's rough. Quote, the Bone Wars was the name given to a bitter competition between two paleontologists, Yale's O.C. Marsh and Edward Drinker Cope of Philadelphia. Their mutual dislike, paired with their scientific ambition, led them to race dinosaur names into publication, each trying to outdo the other, unquote. So supposedly these two guys hated each other so much that they would smash skeletons to keep the other guy from getting them. They were, it was pretty bitter. I mean, that is so horrific to me. That that would be like killing a patient from a major psychological study because you didn't want the other guy to get the fucking paper out first. It's also a weird strategy. Like, you know, now, now there's less bones for you. Less bones for everybody. I mean, it was just nuts. They, these guys were insane. I think I mentioned earlier the Diplodocus. I think that actually was one that was disproven as doesn't even exist yeah. because of the bone wars. A great example is the previously mentioned Brontosaurus from a 2012 NPR article titled Forget Extinct, the Brontosaurus Never Even Existed. Marsh was so eager to one-up the competition that when he received an Apatosaurus skeleton, he misidentified it as a completely new animal. Quote, although the mistake was spotted by scientists by 1903, the brontosaurus lived on in movies, books, and children's imaginations, unquote. And then all of that changed again in 2015, when scientists decided that there was enough variation to consider brontosaurus its own creature, yet again. Quote, we were very surprised when we got these results that brontosaurus was valid again, unquote. So yeah, not an exact science. Yeah. Makes me feel slightly better about psychology, but only slightly. So I'm happy to report, though, that we do finally have a complete Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton. The first complete Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton was only discovered two years ago in Italy. It's pretty dramatic. It was engaged in a battle with a Triceratops. Apparently, they took each other out. Hmm. Gotta give that Triceratops some credit. He did not go down easily. No, but I mean, motherfucker did have three horns. You better make use of those while you're coming at Captain Toothy McTootherson. The pair of skeletons is nicknamed the Dueling Dinosaurs. Hmm, I really reached for that one. I like to think maybe they weren't fighting. Hmm. Maybe it was some interspecies cross-pollination. Oh! Maybe their forbidden lovemaking was was (laughs) so intense and climactic that they both expired simultaneously. Star-crossed dinos (laughs) take their life. (laughs) I can dream. Wherefore art thou, Tyrannosaur? (laughs) Let's talk about the largest predator to ever walk the earth. That was the largest animal, but now we're talking about the largest uh, badass. Hmm? Spinosaurus. Oh, this guy, isn't this the guy who made uh, an appearance in Jurassic Park 4 or something? Jurassic Park 3. Mm. And if you Google Spinosaurus on your smartphone, you can play with a 3D model of one. There's an option to download the Google app and use the uh, augmented reality function to, like, place it in your living room or whatever. Sounds terrifying. Thanks, no. It's pretty fun for like 45 seconds. Oh. The Spinosaurus looked kind of like a supersized T-Rex with a crocodile-ish head and a large spiny ridge running like a bat wing down its back. So like that one dinosaur with the bat wing back and the other crocodile and then, you know, Tyrannosaurus Rex. This sort of looks like maybe the Bone Wars were involved or something because it just feels like they smashed a bunch of different animals together when you look at this thing. Yeah. It seems unlikely, but okay. Sure, man. 
The Spinosaurus was taller than T-Rex. It was longer and heavier. It was also dumber and slower, with weaker jaws. In a fight between a T-Rex and a Spinosaurus, I would definitely put my money on the T-Rex, and so would many experts. Yeah, actually, there's a, a short document, well, not short, like 30, 45 minutes documentary called Bigger Than T-Rex uh, on the Spinosaurus that I've watched. And they go, but they, they actually go into that and they're like, yeah, so if like the T-Rex was wandering around a river in the old Jurassic period and right. stuck its skull in its mouth, it might die. Because the otherwise... Spinosaurus was uh, a, a sort of amphibious. He lived he, like a crocodile, yeah. like his big crocodile head. He was uh, most comfortable in the water. He had small little kind of uh, serrated teeth. And yeah, he could have dragged T-Rex maybe into a lake or something. But on land, no. Not so much. However, that's not the conclusion you will come to if you watch Jurassic Park 3. No. In which a Spinosaurus snaps the neck of a T-Rex, further proving that every new Jurassic Park movie after number one is just absolute garbage. Yeah, flaming hot garbage. You can watch that travesty of a movie scene on YouTube. At least it'll give you a sense of the relative sizes of these two critters. I like to refer to dinosaurs as critters. It, It makes them less scary. Unfortunately, this heavyweight battle never would have taken place. The Spinosaurus lived some 30 million years before the Tyrannosaurus. But I do like to imagine what it would have been like. So let's compare. So in this corner, weighing in at around 15,000 pounds, the King Lizard with a top speed 17 miles per hour, a mouth stuffed with foot-long teeth and a biting force of 57,000 pounds, top-notch vision, an incredible sense of smell, undisputed star of stage and screen, Tyrannosaurus Rex. And in the opposite corner... Literally twice as heavy at 30,000 pounds, presumably muscle, but, you know, maybe he was just an enthusiastic snacker. (laughs) No body shaming. Hey. He was taller by just a few feet, but up to 20 feet longer with an unfolded Japanese fan weirdly sewn onto his back. (laughs) Slower physically and intellectually, with practically no sense of smell and vision that could be best described as meh. (laughs) Teeth half as long as a T-Rex with a paltry 19,000 pounds of bite force. Less than half of T-Rex power. The sacrificial lamb. I mean, Spinosaurus. (laughs) I don't think it's really a contest. It's really not. I'm pretty sure the T-Rex would just walk up and be like, Hello, buffet. It would just only maybe if the Spinosaurus had longer arms. But it looks like he didn't. He still really had kind of like lame little T-Rex arms. But maybe if he had like big bulky arms, he could have wrestled the T-Rex or slapped him around a little bit. Or, like, or, you know, held his hand on his forehead yeah. and just kept him at bay. Classic meme. <laughs> Problem is his head was too long, so he wouldn't actually be able to see the T-Rex. He would just yeah. have to sort of do it by touch. Yeah, and if you get your hand too close to his mouth, uh, that's that 50,000 pounds of bite force. You won't have bigger arms than a T-Rex for very long. No, no. Uh, dramatic shortening will take place. Picture a bear trap, but bladed. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the Bigger Than T-Rex uh, documentary also talked about how their arms were actually longer than a T-Rex. Like, they, they theorized for a little while that it might have been quasi-quadrupedal. Hmm. Maybe for swimming. Yeah. It'd be great if he had fins. I'd like to see him thwacking a T-Rex around the head and shoulders with his little fins. <laughs> bapity bap bap <laughs> bapity bap <laughs> People, Most people don't know what that refers to because they didn't make it that far because right. they only got the sample of last week's episode. But that mm-hmm. was probably the hardest I've laughed in quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> Quit fapping the struggle. <laughs> Quit struggling, fap, fap, fap. Oh, oh God. Good We're times. morons. All right. Let's talk about the largest insect that ever lived. You don't seem excited about that. It's gross. <laughs> yeah. This was during the Permian period, Meganeropsis permiana. It's a very cool name for what is essentially an oversized dragonfly. Oh. Or more accurately, a griffin fly, which is an even cooler name for an oversized dragonfly. At first, I was not particularly impressed with the pictures of this thing mm. uh, until I read more about it. It has a wingspan of a couple feet and large, powerful front mandibles. Yeah. It was highly maneuverable, able to swoop and dart and change direction on a dime. It was a predator feeding on giant roaches and roach like insects. As babies, the griffin fly nymphs lived in the water and developed their mandibles and their powerful jaws very early, so they would be chomping on fish and other large water insects. So yeah, pretty much an absolute horror show. I was going to say, you mentioned it would only feed on, like, you know, other insects and roaches and shit. I was like, it ain't feeding on ro- on rodents and mammals. Cool. And then you were like, eh, yeah, and fish. And I was like, oh. Well, it fed on what was available. Had there been a human. Mm. 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 Yeah. It would at least try a, it'd take a sample. 
Take a bite out of Shane. Yeah, like you might be able to win, but I, it's not a battle that I want. Mm. I, I don't want any of that smoke. Mm -mm. Just keep your mandibles away from me. <laughs> Thankfully, it could not exist today because it relied on the higher oxygen content of the air during the Permian period. Insects do not have lungs. They breathe through a network of tracheal tubes. They're basically aliens. Mm -hmm. The last of the Meganeropsis was killed off by the volcanoes of the Permian extinction. And uh, I've always been on the fence about volcano eruptions. They can be very entertaining and majestic. They can also be a real nuisance if, they're, if there's lava in your backyard. Or, you know, they coat the entire island you're living on in ash. Yeah, but uh, in this case, you know, good work. Good job. Volcanoes. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Welcome. Good job. Well, let's talk about the largest land mammal. Cool. It also has one of the best names ever, a hornless rhinoceros that lived in Eurasia, as big as five elephants, the Paraceratherium, reigned during the Oligocene epoch around 20 or 30 million years ago. The Oligocene? What? The, the primary... Paraceratherium. Okay, see, that sounds like it was named by Paris Hilton on a drinking jag. Its name means near the hornless beast indicating that it was similar to the Aceratherium, mm. another prehistoric hornless rhino that had been discovered earlier. Mm. Near or nearly? Nearly, I guess. Not mm. ge geographically near, but it was similar to. Yeah. So it's kind of like nearly this creature. It's kind of a disrespectful name, though, because it's you're just naming it based on the fact that it kind of looks like another creature. You couldn't come up with a, its own name? This would be like if your parents had another child... And they named it Looks Like Duncan. It would be like my name being not Alex. Yeah. This is Alex and not Alex. Mm -hmm. Nearly Alex. Eh, nearly. Just a step down. A little shorter. Not as smart. Yeah. So like the rhino of today, the Paraceratherium had a large prehensile upper lip, obviously much bigger than the modern rhino's version, and was almost like a short trunk. Its legs have been described as pillar-like. And yeah. A 20-ton body needs some pillars. Fuck. This thing wasn't going to be tap dancing around on some knock-kneed giraffe legs. No, although that would be terrifying as well. Giraffes are the only megafauna that does not make sense to me from a, you know, load-bearing and stability standpoint. I feel like we're running into the ant problem here. I don't mm. know how such spindly legs support a... They're pretty big, large critter. They are. Although I do find their method of, of uh, attacking one another extremely hilarious. Yeah, those, they just whack the shit out of each other with their big ass heads, heads and necks. Yeah, the, because the, the, those knobbly horns that they have, the mm -hmm. males have, they use, basically they use their whole heads as maces and they just swing them on their muscly ass necks into each other. They use the necks too. The necks will be smacking and whacking. <laughs> fapping and bapping. <laughs> bapping and fapping and smacking and whacking. <laughs> Giraffes are funny looking. They are the weird, I think they are the weirdest looking creatures uh, of megafauna that we have today. Yeah. They, they definitely skipped leg day. <laughs> <laughs> so the Paraceratherium was about 16 feet tall, uh, 24 feet long. Its head alone was four feet long. Hmm. I love that they say it was as big as five elephants. Just makes me think of a stack of elephants in a trench coat trying to get into a movie theater or something. This is rated Paraceratherium. <laughs> uh, we can get in, right? Elephants, get out of the trench coat. <laughs> no one knows why the Paraceratherium went extinct but I'm assuming it just wanted to because no one was telling this thing shit. shit. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, Paraceratherium, you can't pa... Uh, you know what? I'm terribly sorry. I misread that sign. Do as you will. <laughs> so finally, I promised we would talk about those GOT staples, the dire wolves. Yeah, yeah. The name means terrible or dreadful wolf, which again, kind of rude. Hmm. Yeah, They're not inherently more terrible than a regular wolf. That just feels like an unnecessary value judgment. I mean, I would be more terrified of a regular lion or a saber-toothed tiger than I would a dire wolf. I just feel like terrible implies that there's like something wrong with it or that it's mean. Mm. It's just like, it's, he's still just a wolf. He's doing his thing. Yeah. He's not any more terrible than a wolf. All wolves are going to try to eat you if they're hungry. Or if you're there and they want to store meat for later. Or if you're, you know, pulling their tail mm. and being a dick. <laughs> Don't pull a wolf tail. <laughs> what idiot Chad is like getting like climbing the fence to go pull on a dire wolf? Look, Dad, I do got to do. Oh, you it's your last that. YouTube stunt, buddy. <laughs> I want to see that. I want to see those practical joke guys go pull a dire wolf tail. Yeah, Chad McFuckwit has got his 15 seconds of fame right there. 
So similar to the woolly mammoth and ground sloth and saber-toothed tiger, these were staples of the Ice Age, the end of which coincides with the rise of humanity. Dire wolves would have hunted giant sloths and battled massive wildcats, although I doubt they chased saber-toothed tigers the way dogs these days chase house cats. Yeah, not unless there were like 15 of them. I don't think saber-toothed tigers were running up a tree. No, I'm not saying they couldn't. I'm pretty sure they would just turn around and like Mick Dundee be like, that's not a tooth. This is a tooth. (laughs) (laughs) Dire wolf fossils, by the way, very prevalent at the La Brea Tar Pits. We can Hmm. go see some. Dire wolves probably looked a lot like modern gray wolves, just slightly larger and with a much stronger bite. Hmm. Recent genetic sequencing has actually revealed that despite the resemblance, their relation to modern wolves is extremely distant. They are more closely related to the African black-backed jackal. Hmm. Their closest common wolf ancestor would have died off around 5.5 million years ago. According to University of Alberta anthropological archaeologist Robert Luzzi, or Lossie, quote, that you would have this convergence in body form, even though you have such a long period of separation, suggests that the wolf body form is very, very successful and clearly has been for a very long time, unquote. It also suggests that there were some very lonely-ass wolves who were like, eh, close enough. Fuck, I haven't fucked anything in a while. This is black back jackal and this cold-ass wolf from Siberia just sort of sow each other in the middle of Europe one day, ancient Europe. Just, mm, let's bang it out, sure. So yeah, wolf, very successful form factor. If you have to choose a creature to be, be one with giant teeth and a pack of buddies. You'll last a long time. Yeah. You might end up on a leash at some point, begging for treats, though. it's Evolution is a cruel mistress, or people are a cruel mistress. Yeah, I would just say people. And besides, have you ever seen any of those wolf mixtures on leashes begging for treats? They pretty much just sort of look at you and stare, <laughs> and you're like, I'll just give you a treat. Could you stop drooling and staring at me like I'm a lamb chop? Yeah, wolves are another thing that I don't think of as, like, cute. They're cool. Mm. They're cool looking. I like wolves. Not cute. Mm. I think they can be adorable when they are babies. Baby everything other than humans for me is cute. And like larva. I don't find larva cute. Yeah. No. No. Baby insects. Slimy. Mandibles. No, thank you. Slimy. Check. Terrifying. Check. Can possibly be in your skin. Check. Yeah. No part of me wants a part of that. Yeah. Baby humans and baby insects. No, thank you. Yeah. Well, let's just call them what they are. Larval humans and larval insects. Mm -hmm. Boo. Hosts. Yeah. They're parasites. (laughs) Babies are parasites. I told that to a woman one time. We were a pregnant woman. You are brave. We were. were, It was even worse than that. I did this guided hike thing one time with this corporation, and there was a woman that was pregnant, and she was asking me why I haven't reproduced yet. Hmm. And I was like, I have a whole, you know, kind of theory about that. I'm I'm not so interested in, in children and reproduction. And she was like, oh, tell me. And, I, and uh, life hack, uh, don't don't <laughs> tell people your theories on uh, reproduction when they're pregnant, especially if you're a misanthropist like me. Yeah. yeah. See, this is where I should have been around. I just would have clapped my hand over your mouth and my other hand right at the back across your skull. Like, what are you doing? She didn't argue with me. She just got really quiet. And it was uh, it was an awkward walk back the rest of the time. <laughs> to quote most New Yorkers, what are you fucking stupid? Oops. Oopsie. So those were some of the most extreme and interesting versions of megafauna, as determined by me. Hmm. We skipped a few of the more common examples. We didn't really go into detail on woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers. I just feel like they've been overexposed. We have seen them in movies and cartoons and whatever. But I'm betting a few of you didn't know about the Paraceratherium. Mm-mm. So I just wanted to say that one more time. I, I know. <laughs> I can always tell because you'll say a certain word with the relish. I'm thrilled. Hmm. I'm going to bring that up. I'll find a way to slip that into conversation at some point. I know you will. (laughs) We have new patrons. Get there! Andrew Peterson, a new Midnight Menace. Thank you, Andrew. Mr. Peterson. And Keel Starforth. I'm sorry, say that again. (laughs) Another Midnight Menace and clearly a Jedi. Or (laughs) had hippie parents. One of the two. A short review. Five stars. Quality content. Hey guys, love your podcast. I listen to it all day at work, and it's so nice having different voices in my head to listen to. (laughs) (laughs) It meant for that now, bro. We love you, but, you know, we're the ones who do love you. The other voices lie. Uh, Just throwing this out there. The other one, probably Satan. Hmm. I hate it when you call me that. We've asked you not to. 
Hope you guys keep it coming. Can't wait to hear what's next. And that was Deathbat9981 by Apple Podcasts. Deathbat. Deathbat oh. hearing voices in his head. I, yeah. This is, mm. It's getting worse. The story is not <laughs> rolling along well. Thank you for uh, your review and get help. <laughs> get help. It pays. <laughs> and that's it. All right. Oh, Deathbat and Star Lord or whoever you were. Starforth? Keel Starforth. All right, Deathbat and uh, Starforth, go forth and find even more friends for us to play with and mess with their names and generally be idiots with. And don't you, forget Andrew Peterson. I mean, Andrew Peterson just sounds like your average serial killer. He's fine. <laughs> Andrew Peterson's the one that you don't expect to have the voices in the head. Yeah. You, you don't see him coming. No. Yeah. Well, I mean, you might see his van coming, but you know, not him. Anyway. <laughs> you see him fapping. And struggle. <laughs> struggle fapping. <laughs> Fappy bap. What was the Fappy Fap? Fappy Bappy. Fappy Bappy. <laughs> I cut that part out where you said Fappy Bappy, which I felt bad about later because I was, was like, oh, we missed out on Fappy Bappy. Oh, man. That is so ridiculous. Anyway, all you guys out there, please continue to join the Discord. Come on down through. Give, you know, throw some love at uh, Shane on the Instagramage. And, you know, keep telling folk, keep reviewing. You guys are killing it out there. We appreciate all the love and all the support. Every single one of you patrons helps pay for our next, you know, publicity push. Our, what, we're planning to do, some kind of tour. The more you folks join the Patreon, the more likely that becomes. Help Shane and Duncan visit the La Brea Tar Pits. Yes. I want to see hot oiled mammoths. That okay. sounds <laughs> way, just way more sexual. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm clearly not going to the same pits that Shane is going to. I just wanted to go hang out with Zed, be drunk in front of Zed for a minute. He wanted to go to some sort of weird mammoth massage parlor oily, that I don't know about. Oily mammoth action. Yeah. <laughs> Nuru mammoth massage. All right. And as per usual, and forever after. Knowledge is power. Sleep is overrated.